So I come from Johannesburg, which is, um, yeah, oh, there's some South Africans here. I don't know what it is about South Africans, but wherever you go in the world, they're there. Yeah. It's, it's quite strange. But it, it, it took me 32 hours to get here. It, it literally is the other side of the world. Um, but it's wonderful uh, to be here. Where, where I come from in Johannesburg, it's close to 40 degrees at the moment. There's a, there's a drought and there's, a, uh, there's water restrictions. So um, to be here surrounded by snow-capped mountains and, and freezing temperatures is actually quite refreshing. I was actually craving some rain. Um, but... Um, it seems you guys got some good weather, unfortunately. I just need water, water. Oh. Um, uh, but I've had so much fun so far. Um, my friend Steve took me around the city. He uh, took me to a nudist beach. Um, it was two degrees, and when I saw the sign, I thought it was compulsory. So it was, um, man, it was uncomfortable. Um, he didn't tell me otherwise, as well. So, you know, we, we obey rules in South Africa, so I just kind of went with it. Um, um, yeah, but it's, it's been wonderful. And um, so this morning, I'm just going to share a little bit of, of, of my story. And the, the topic is wisdom for the wild, um, practical wisdom for passionate worshipers. Um, I originally was told or thought this was going to be a breakout session. So I kind of emotionally prepared for that. So I'm just going to pretend this is a breakout session. And you guys all chose me. Um, <laughs> feel sorry for all those other lame breakout sessions happening right now. There's no one there. <laughs> Poor guys. Um, but so wisdom for the wild. Practical wisdom for passionate worshipers. Now, if I were to go with, with my default, uh, the natural inclination um, of who I am, I would spend the whole 30 minutes just talking about the passionate and the wild side. Um, that's kind of the, the default of my life. It's the way I've always um, lived growing up, sometimes quite reckless, but it was definitely passionate. Um, it's the way I try to live now, and it's probably the way God made me, and I probably the way I always will live. Um, I, I was the kind of guy growing up where in my room I'd have opposed to saying, always set the trail, never follow the path, or um, if you don't live on the edge, you won't see the view, you know, and it's kind of like passion and stepping out and, you know, don't want anything ordinary. Uh, for those that know me really well, my favorite quote of all time, um, until recently, I'll tell you why, um, was um, from Braveheart, um, the brave may not live forever, but the cautious may not live at all. And that's just, oh, man, brave, brave. And I just, for some reason, I just had this, like, picture of William Wallace from Braveheart just riding up and down on his horse and uh, just talking to the army and saying, come on, we're going to charge. The brave won't live forever. Passion, passion, wildness. Come on. And so I just I Googled it, William Wallace, brave may not live forever, Braveheart, and nothing came up. did a bit of research, actually from the Princess Diaries. I don't, I'm not saying I watched it, but um, it's true, and it, it, there's passion everywhere, but I just love it. The principle remains the same, even though it was not Braveheart. Um, and I just think of, uh, of David, and he, you know, he's, David in the Bible, he, just, I mean, he sang passionately, he lived passionately, he loved passionately, sometimes a little bit too, too passionately. <laughs> Whew, man, um, and and Peter, and you know he's he's the guy that's jumping out of the boat when he sees Jesus. Just um, he's cutting off ears. He's fearlessly proclaiming the gospel. And uh, Paul, um, you know, he's singing in chains in prison, and earthquakes come, and he's getting shipwrecked, and he's shaking off snakes off his arm. And once again, same, just fearlessly stepping out and um, proclaiming the gospel. And just those are the kind of stories. Those are the kind of scriptures that that I naturally turn to. And I love it. And passion is such a good thing. And it's such an important ingredient um, for change. Okay? If you look at, I mean, anything that's really made history, there's pretty much, I'm sure, there's been a lot of passion behind it. Um, but what God has been speaking to me and my wife about 
lately is not to replace passion. It's the way we are, the way we should be. It's the way we always will be. But he's just talking to us and guiding us and growing us in the ways of practical wisdom as well. And um, I mean, even David, um, the scripture, you know, he's this passionate person, but he also says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart. It wasn't just this reckless um, passion or wildness. You know, he really, really wanted to know God's ways and, and God's words. So, so God's been speaking to us and stirring us and guiding us and growing us in practical wisdom, which is, which is not my default. It doesn't come naturally to me like the, the passionate side. For example, Denise and I would be, my wife, you know, we would be, um, you know, we'll, we'll want to sell everything. Let's sell everything, Lord, and we'll give it all and we'll do it. And God's like, you'll sell everything, but will you do a budget, you know? Or, um, you know, we'll go anywhere, you say. We'll go anywhere. We'll mud hut in Mozambique, you know, big city, other end of the world, no matter what you do, where you lead us, we'll follow. And God's like, yes, but will you stay, you know? And just like just growing us in the ways of wisdom sometimes, you know. And um, so what we did, we decided to um, start reading Proverbs um, every single day. Um, just a little practical step, just the book of wisdom, just reading one proverb a day. And just really started noticing some amazing practical wisdom just filter into every part of our lives. And um, while I was reading that, just noticed a few proverbs that are so pertinent and important to worship leaders and to passionate people. And it just feels like every worship leader or artist or creative person needs to hear some of these. Well, I certainly did. And I want you to know, it's kind of like my little exclusion clause. Um, not everyone might be applicable to you. Um, there's quite a few scriptures. Um, and the other thing I wanted you to know is that they're not the kind of scriptures that make you feel warm and fluffy and fuzzy inside. They're quite convicting. They're quite hard-hitting, which I think is so great. Sometimes we need that. We need to be challenged in the way we um, are living and the way we're leading and the way we're doing ministry. So um, I'd love to share these problems with you. And my hope really is that um, one or two, or three, or however many of these proverbs would really be just become these statements or axioms or literally proverbs that you can just draw on in times of leading and in times of um, ministry and in times of living. And when you face a certain situation in your own character or in your team or in your family, and you can just draw on it and go, oh, remember what that said. Remember what that said. So what I've done, um, you know, in this journey of just... Um, reading through the Proverbs, I kind of also thought about a few areas that we as worship leaders really need to be careful of. Um, a few little pitfalls that I've seen in my own life and um, in the lives of people on my team. Um, so I'd love to share just four areas, and they all begin with I, which is miraculous. That wasn't intentional at all, you know. Um, and, um, and then just we're going to turn to the Proverbs and see what they say about it. So before we do that, I'd love to pray and um, just ask God just to really just show us and convict us if there's one scripture or one statement that we're going to draw on and that's going to shift the way we lead. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we, we trust your word, Lord. Um, we trust you. We don't trust our own worldly wisdom or our own um, you know, personal inclinations or defaults. We trust you, Lord God. And just ask that you would just open up our hearts and convict us, Lord, with um, your word, Lord God. That you would just reveal to us which ones we need to hear. That you reveal areas in our lives um, that this needs to speak into. So, God, we fully and wholeheartedly trust you and ask that you would speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just poured water over the mic. Wisdom number one, don't pour water over mic. Okay, the first I, I, the first I pitfall is literally as simple as that. It's I, 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 the I problem. Sometimes we are very much I experts. So the day I was 
flying out to Canada, it was on Tuesday from Johannesburg, I was in the garden um, in South Africa and um, I cut the cornea in my eye. A couple of hours before I was going, I was there and this lion came through, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. It was, um, I was actually just, it was actually a plant and I was just, you know, bending down um, <laughs> and this really sharp plant went into my eye and it was really sore. I mean, it sounds silly, thanks, but um, it was really sore, so I mean, I couldn't open it, and I had to go to the optometrist, and then they sent me to the eye expert, which is the ophthalmologist. About, I mean, literally three hours before I was about to fly, and it just reminded me of a of a story my dad used to say and um, tell me about a guy at his work, um, that was really like, uh, had a, you know, thought it was all about himself, and uh, this this guy used to arrive on his helicopter to the office, and. Um, Whenever he arrived, the whole office was like the ego has landed, and then you'd walk through the corridor, and then everyone were going, the ophthalmologist is here, you know, the eye specialist, eye, 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 you know. And we, for some reason, we get into a habit of thinking that it's about us. I don't, I don't actually know why. It's just this natural default. And I remember reading Rick Warren's amazing book, Purpose Driven Life, a long time ago, thinking that this is going to be the ultimate self-help book, and first page and the first line says it's not about you and it was such a good reminder from the start it's not about us it's about god's glory and this is what the proverb says first proverb proverbs 25 verse 6 do not exalt yourself in the king's presence the message version says don't work yourself into the spotlight sure it's a tough one especially in, you know, the roles that we have. Um, I remember, I hope none of you follow Worship Central on Twitter because this particular story was shared two days ago. Um, um, <laughs> but um, in South Africa, once a year, we have something called Starlight Classics, which is the most amazing, dramatic, extravagant fireworks display. And it's in a massive park. And so you just imagine thousands of people sitting in this massive park with the most incredible view. It just goes on forever. And what was happening is that these dramatic fireworks are going into the sky. And it was beautiful. And everyone was like, oh, wow. But in the distance, there was this really raging um, storm in the distance. And it was stirring, you know, classic South African thunderstorm. And it got bigger and bigger. And then next thing, there was lightning flashing across the sky. And it was just something else that no one had seen. And eventually, it got to the stage where the fireworks would propel into the sky. And everyone was like, uh, lame. And then the lightning would flash. And everyone would be like, oh, yes, and applaud and erupt, you know. And it was just such a good reminder that, you know, what we can do is, is okay. You know, it's, it's beautiful and we must strive to, to give our all and, you know, be creative and, and be excellent. But, wow, man, we need to step aside and go, Jesus, you know, he's the only one that really deserves all the attention. He really does. He is extravagantly beautiful. He is the only one that deserves all the attention, all the worship. He's so much better than what we can do, really. But sometimes we lose perspective. Hey, next proverb. It says, Proverbs 15, verse 33, Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, and humility comes before honor. And that really just speaks of perspective. Fearing the Lord just speaks of perspective. And I think it's so important for us just to constantly just remind ourselves and just renew our perspective that he alone is great, you know? And that just, we got to humble ourselves before him. Um, my dad is amazing. He's so much better than your dad. But um, he really is, <laughs> man. Um, <laughs> so he's, he's like 66 now. Um, and in the last two years, he... No, last three years, he decided to climb Mount, Kilim uh, 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 Mount Kenya, which is the second highest mountain in Africa. And I mean, I mean so then he was 63, uh, 64. And then the following year, he climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, which many of you might know is the highest mountain in Africa. And he's just an just amazing, amazing strong man. And they asked him to write just a bit of a story 
about his experience on Mount Kilimanjaro. And um, they put it in a book and they put pictures. Um, and I just took out a quote of what he said. This is what my dad said. I'll never forget the sight of the mighty, majestic Kilimanjaro, decked in its snowy finery and towering over the African plains below. People talk about conquering mountains. Hey, have you heard that? Are we going to conquer the mountain? People talk about conquering mountains. It's a silly notion. All we do is reach the top and commune with the mountain. And we go into its presence and through this, into the presence of God. All we do is commune with it. We don't conquer it. We just get to walk on it. You know? It's all we get. You know, it's just, it's a silly notion. And it's, it's an amazing metaphor. I mean, in Psalm 97, it says, mountains melt like wax before the Lord. You know? God is majestic. He is powerful. And it's a metaphor. I mean, it is by grace alone that we get to commune with God. It's by grace alone it's nothing that we could do. It's not because of our goodness or our gifting. He is so great, and he allows us to commune with him, to be in his presence, to be in relationship with him. He's mindful of us, and he loves us. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, and humility comes before honor. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord. I'm going to move on because it's quite a lot. So don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not saying we need to, you know, walk around. And humility is not about going, you know, we are terrible. We've got nothing to offer. That is not what it is at all. C.S. Lewis um, says, um, humility is not thinking of your, thinking less of yourself. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. You know? So don't get me wrong. You know, we, we've got something to offer. You know, and we should confidently and, and boldly, you know, step in that gifting and step in that life. But this whole thinking of yourself less um, statement becomes quite difficult because it's so strange. We go, it's not about us, not about us, not about us. But then every week we get put on a stage and we get big speakers and we get 17,000 lights shone on us and um, everyone's looking at us and, you know, singing at us, but past us, and it's just, it's just strange. It's a weird, if you think about it, it's actually a weird concept, you know. Um, I understand, I understand, you know, why we do it, but this kind of stuff challenges us, you know. It challenges us thinking of it's not about us, it's not about us, it's not about us, it's not about us. Um, and, and then it starts speaking into the next I. So the first I was I, 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 I. The next I is integrity, Another issue that sometimes we struggle with. <laughs> and this is what the proverb says. Proverbs 27, verse 21. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold. But people are tested by their praise. The message version says the purity of human hearts is tested by giving them a little fame. Ooh. The purity of human hearts is tested by giving them a little fame. In Psalm 78, it says, David shepherded them with integrity of heart and skillful hands he led them. Human hearts are tested by giving them a little fame. It's just a quick story. Um, and I was undecided whether to, to share this, but, you know, why not? Because it, it might be speaking exactly against what I'm trying to say. But um, so, so I'm very, I'm very, I mean, I love music. I really do. But I'm very clear that music will excite people and stir people, but the Spirit of God is what's gonna really gonna change people's lives, you know? So um, I'm very clear that music is not my first passion. Um, I'm so much more intrigued by, by worship and people and leadership and um, justice and, oh man, it's just, it's amazing stuff. Um, but what I did recently, I, um, I did a little album. And um, it's never really been like an idol thing, or it's it's never really been a massive focus. Um, I was very hands off in it, and um, recently we just released it in South Africa, and it turns out it it it, it started doing pretty well there, and um, you know things like charts are very fickle. For any of you that know, it, I mean, it, just, it can go up and down, but in South African context, it went to number one on the iTunes charts, and I was like, oh man, this is cool. 
human hearts are tested by giving them a little bit of fame, you know? And suddenly I was like, oh, this thing that I never really was consumed about or never really cared about suddenly became a thing. And I was like, oh, man. And then like the social media, cell phone comes out and you go, hmm, maybe I should share this with the world, you know? So I took like a screenshot of the charts. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Check this out. And, um, and the whole time I'm feeling completely unsettled. You know, I just know, I know this is not what I want to do. I know this is not who I am. And I'm not saying it's wrong for everyone, but sometimes we need to know what our, um, you know, pitfalls might be. And for me, this is something I should have avoided completely, you know? So I take a screenshot and I put it online and I post it. And I'm like, yes, check it out, world. Did you know that within five minutes, someone else took the charts, took the number one charts? <laughs> and you know who it was? Jad? <laughs> Hillsong. Within five minutes. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> oh. oh, that's difficult. <laughs> but <laughs> just, you know, human heart to test it by giving ourselves a little bit of fame. So two proverbs that maybe can help us um, uh, in this integrity. Um, so Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Everything you do. We so often, as musicians and worship leaders, we talk about um, the flow of music. But how often do we talk about the flow of our hearts? We need to guard our hearts. We don't want there to be this massive gap between what we sing and how we live. We've heard this all before. We really have. Um, A.W. Tozer, great author, he says, Christians don't just tell lies, they go to church and sing them. You know? How much of a gap is there? So, two proverbs that kind of stood out to me that maybe might help. There's so many things you need to do to help with integrity, but these two from Proverbs that stood out to me. Number one, Proverbs 27 verse 2. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth. An outsider, and not your own lips. Let someone else praise you. Just step aside. Let someone else praise you. I wish one of my friends would have put the charts up. They didn't. Lame. Ex-friends. Let someone else praise you. Next one, which is quite big. Um, I, I suppose every, everyone in this context is different, but I'm pretty sure this is big everywhere, and I'm pretty sure from what the Bible says, no matter where you live, this should be big. Um, but I do understand everyone's context is different. Proverbs 29, verse 7. The righteous care about the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Is our worship on, you know, so much more than just Sunday. And the more I read the Bible and the more I look around, it seems like God has a heart for helping the poor, you know. God has a heart for creativity and music and uh, worship through the expression of music. But man, we need to step out beyond the songs and really go help the poor. Um, it says in the Bible, religion that is pure and faultless is helping the widow and the orphan, you know? Um, you know, Jesus talks about, at the end, separating people into those that, you know, clothe the naked, you know, fed the hungry. And it, it, this is hard-hitting, you know? And I, I suppose in my context in South Africa, this is in your face every day. So we drive down, you know, uh, the road and we confronted with this at every traffic light. Um, but I'm pretty convinced no matter where we are in the world, we need to be looking at our expression of worship beyond the songs. I really think we do. And that gives us integrity. You know, that we're not willing just to stand up here and make pretty sounds, but we're willing to go out and live a life of worship. And it says, it says in the Bible, live a life worthy of the calling you've received. You know, you've got to do it. 
I'm going to move on because I think we're um, running out of time. Do you know how much time i got left? No. Do you know, Peter? Okay, time. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. The next I um, that I think worship leaders struggle with is, is I for isolation. And um, I'm not necessarily talking about the isolation that we sometimes feel when we um, don't feel understood or we don't find community and that's so real it really is and that's part of what worships why worship central exists is you know to to get a community of, of worship leaders and worshipers and to provide a place where we can connect but the isolation i want to talk about now because of limited time is the isolation that we intentionally choose sometimes as artists and passionate people and worship leaders we intentionally like to fly solo I don't know if this is just me, but I love to fly solo. And sometimes we find it difficult to settle into a community and to commit to something local. Um, Proverbs 12 verse 11 says, Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. <laughs> those who chase fantasies have no sense. Now, we've got to be so careful with this. I'm not saying that chasing fantasies and dreaming is bad. I I am the biggest dreamer. I live in a dream. I'm always thinking, what next, what next? But the danger is, is that we always, always, always think, what next, what next, what next, what next, what next, that we struggle to live right now. Um, it, it took me like four years to hang up pictures in my house, you know, because I was like, I'm ultimately going, you know. Like, we are on a road, you know. We're not going to be here forever, so let's just, you know, let's not, you know, mess up the walls, you know, <laughs> you know. And eventually it's like, no, just put down roots where you are. Invest in something local. I had a, a, um, a season of flying solo in ministry. It was, I want you to know, it was very exciting. It was amazing. We were involved in loads of different churches and leading worship at different places and uh, meeting different people. And there was kind of this kingdom vibe going on. It was so cool. Um, but I knew ultimately it wasn't sustainable. And then this amazing church approached me and said, we're looking for a worship pastor. Are you in? And I was like, no way. Not a chance. I am loving this kingdom vibe, you know? And they, they stopped me in mid-sentence and said, like, so do we. We also love the kingdom vibe. And we're not asking to, be, to cage you. We're asking you just to be part of a community that can support you, um, that you can support the community, that you can invest into building something local, that you can have people around you to hold you accountable um, and to, to guide you and refine you. And it's just been, it was a tough decision, but it's been the best thing I could have done. Invest into something local, local church, local church, local church. I mean, all these guys, these phenomenal leaders that we have here. I mean, it's, this is rare to have people like Jad, Tim, and Christy here in one room. It's rare, but they're all based in local church, you know? They're not just flying around doing stadiums. You know, they're in local church. They believe in the local church. The next way we isolate ourselves is we isolate ourselves because we struggle to take advice. This is what the Proverbs says. So I know, I know there's lots here, but the point was I'm just throwing out Proverbs and one or two may stick. Listen to advice, Proverbs 19, verse 20. Listen to advice and accept discipline. And at the end, you'll be counted among the wise. Listen to advice and accept discipline. And at the end, you will be counted among the wise. 27, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Bill Hybels from Willow Creek Church, he's an amazing leader. He talks about having a constellation of leaders around him. And um, the reason why he calls it a constellation is because they stars. And he says, get people around you that are better than you, that are stars at what they do, so they can challenge you and refine you. And that's part of humility, I suppose, as well. Be going, I'm going to listen to advice. I'm going to intentionally put people around me that can speak into my life and refine me. Don't fly solo. Don't fly solo. It's so tempting. It was so tempting for me. But it's so much better when you have people around you. Okay, last I. <laughs> this is also quite hard-hitting. Sorry. I for ignorance. 
So basically, the definition of ignorance means um, simplified version is that you're just totally unaware of what's going on. Um, and sometimes we're totally unaware. I remember I was part of a church plant a long time ago, and I don't know if, if any of you are part of church plants. Sometimes you kind of use equipment kind of 3,000 times, and you pack it up and, you know, and lay it out and can get a bit faulty. You know, so that's what we were doing. We had this, you know, rough and ready equipment, and we were setting it up, and we were, we were leading worship, and I had my friend um, Richard playing bass there, and we were leading, and it was just this beautiful time. And next thing, Richard just propels to the back of the stage. And we were like, oh, Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs> Come on, Lord, this is amazing. This is just beautiful. Yeah, Spirit, break out. This is amazing. We carry on worshiping and just kept going, unaware of what's going on, thinking that he's having a moment. He actually got electrocuted through the faulty cables. Um, and like... <laughs> So we were like on our mission, going through the songs and worshiping, completely ignorant to the fact that he needed medical attention, really. Um, oh, but it was funny. Oh, man. Um, gee. Um, and it's just a silly story, really, to say we need to be aware of what we're doing when we worship. Okay. So two things we need to be aware of. We know, two things we need to not be ignorant of, we need to be aware of. Number one, what are we singing? Okay, Proverbs 14, verse 15. The simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. The prudent sift and weigh every word. And this, for me, really speaks about the content of our songs. And I believe it's time that worship leaders really start looking at what we're singing. You know? We need to sift and weigh every single word. Gone are the days where we can just, you know, write a song or pick up a song or sing a song without really going, what are we saying? You know, is it biblical? You know, is it relevant? You know, is this, is this powerful? Let's sift and weigh every word. Let's not be unaware. And let's not just, you know, choose a set list based on, you know, what's hot on the charts or what sounds good. No, what are we singing? You know, what are we singing? I, so in, in the church that I'm at now, wow, I'm surrounded by people that are completely different to me. Um, it is such an interesting context that I've landed up in. Um, very calculated people, very rational, um, very clever, got more degrees than temperature, and, um, and just, you know... Um, if there's like an emotional moment, they'll probably, you know, a lot of chartered accountants, they'll whip out the calculator and do like a risk assessment. Should we respond? Um, you know, what are the pros and cons? You know, are there other, other alternatives? And, but, you know, they're, they're amazing people, though. And um, they are so strong in content, though, and theology. And kind of that's their thing, you know. And everyone's different. So I'm not saying, you know, this is the way it needs to go. But it's been so good for me as a worship leader <laughs> to have to really sift and weigh every single word that I sing, you know? And it feels like every week at the service meeting, I have to have like a PowerPoint presentation of the, you know, the exegesis of the original Greek to kind of prove that this song is okay, you know? And uh, <laughs> you laugh, but it's not too far from the truth, <laughs> you know? And, but, oh, and, and, it's, and it's not the perfect way. And, uh, you know, we challenge each other, you know, with the head and the heart. And, but one thing I will never deny is that it's made me a better worship leader. It's made me a better songwriter. It's made me a better person. Because someone is going, what are you singing? Don't just go with emotions. Just, you know, what are you singing? You know? Second thing, so don't be ignorant about what we're singing. Second thing, don't be ignorant about why we are singing. You know? And I'll just go back to, you know, the global headlines I drive to church and I'm passed by, um, I pass, you know, moms and children at traffic lights that have um, no food and have no place to go. And then you turn the headlines on and there's bombings and terrorist attacks. And you kind of go, why are we singing? Oh, if it's just about music, count me out, surely. There's got to be something more. 
that we're part of. I imagine the guys in 2 Chronicles 20, you know, um, Jehoshaphat was told that this massive army was coming for him. And they came up with a battle plan. I don't know if you've read this. And their battle plan was they're going to send singers out in front of the army. That was the battle plan. It's like, put down your weapons and we're going to go worship. And they went in front of the army and they sang, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Now, surely they weren't ignorant about what they're doing and about the power of worship. And that when they sing and declare the truth about who God is, something else is happening. Surely. I mean, if it was just about the, the music or a cool melody or a great lyric, I'm not going to walk in front of an army. You know, I'm not. Whereas if we're aware that when we declare the truth about who God is, he inhabits the praises of his people, something happens. You know, whether it's hearts that are broken open, whether it's you know, walls that fell down, that happened. Whether it's armies that were defeated, whether it's people that were healed, something happens. It's so much more than what we think. Man, why are we singing? And I suppose when we, when we get that, it, it changes our expectancy for Sunday. You know? We're not, we, we, we arrive there going, oh, this is a holy thing that we're part of. And if we're choosing to step out and declare who God is in the midst of everything that's going on, he inhabits the praises of his people. This is powerful. This is more than, more than a melody. We need to understand the bigger picture. Cool. I'll come into land this now. Um, you know, the bigger picture. Um, in, in the 1960s, John F. Kennedy, um, U.S. president, cast this bigger picture to the country saying that they're going to put a man on the moon. You know? Quite a big picture. Quite a big vision. And um, it's kind of the focus of a lot of communication and PR and this is the big picture. We're going to put a man on the moon. And there's an amazing story about, you know, all the executives and um, the people running the show. They went to go visit Cape Canaveral which is you know, the place where they launched the rockets from, you know, part of NASA. And they were walking around doing meet and greet with all the guys that work at Cape Canaveral, and they went to the lady at, re at reception, like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, answer the phones and direct things, and then went to you know, one of the engineers, and what do you do? Oh, I'm just the chief engineer. I'm just designing this and this and this. And then they bumped into one of the cleaners um, in the bathrooms, and um, they said, oh, how they, what do you do? And he goes, oh, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. You know? And he totally wasn't stuck in this, this picture of I'm a cleaner. No, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. So we need to be aware of the bigger picture. We're not a guitarist. We're not a worship leader. It's just there's a bigger picture going on. You know? We're honoring God. We're stepping into something holy. We're declaring who he is. And as far as I can tell, when we do that, something happens, you know? Putting a man on the moon. Okay, so here's the concern. This is where we'll leave it. The concern is, is that this guy named Solomon, who wrote these Proverbs, was the wisest guy on earth. Um, God gave him divine wisdom, because that's what he asked for. And he had all these words of wisdom, and yet, like, he totally messed things up. You know, if you read about Solomon, like, things didn't end well, you know. God was gracious, um, but all the wisdom didn't make things go smoothly till the end. So what is the solution? Like, Why? You know, it's not about just having a bunch of practical wisdom that we can draw on. It's not about that. Um, and this is the last I, which is not a pitfall. It's a, it's a necessity. And it's I for intimacy. I believe that at the end of the day, when we look at our own lives and we look at Solomon's life, it's a story of the gospel. We need God. You know, we need God to protect us on this journey. We need God to intervene on this journey. We need a relationship with God. We need intimacy with God. It is the foundation for everything. 
especially as worship leaders. We need to be you know, communing with God. We need to be intimate with God. And it just reminded me of um, in Luke 10, when um, with Jesus and Mary and Martha. And I'd just like to read that as we close. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. He sat at his feet. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord said, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Few things are needed, or indeed only one. The message says, one thing only is essential. At the end of the day, few things are needed, or indeed only one. And that is intimacy with God, just to spend time with Him, and nothing can replace that. You know, think about, you know, an amazing, famous scripture in um, Corinthians, you know, love is patient, love is this, love is that. And at, at the end it says, you can do all these things, submit yourself to the flames and give all that you have to the poor. Pretty special things, actually. Speak in the tongues of men and angels, but if you have not loved, you've pretty much done nothing. You know, it says you have not loved, you've done nothing. In fact, drummers, it says you'll be like a clanging cymbal. You know? Few things are needed, or indeed only one. And um, I guess the goal for me is that it wouldn't be um, giving up passion to go with practical wisdom. No way. Um, or it wouldn't be giving up practical wisdom to go with passion. It'll just, you know, it's both. And I just want to grow in both. But we need to just be in intimate relationship with God. That is the fuel for everything we do as worship leaders and and um, and leaders in general and brothers and husbands and wives. Um, we need intimacy with him.